This is the Edexcel GCSE 9 to 1 Maths Paper 1 from the higher tier and it's from the Specimen Papers Set 2. Question 1. For part A we have to factorise y squared plus 27y. Well first of all you'd notice what's common to both is y. So y goes outside the bracket and inside the bracket, we think to ourselves, what do we multiply y by to get y squared? Well, of course, that will just be y. And then we think to ourselves, what do we multiply y by to get 27y? Well, that's just 27. So therefore, y squared plus 27y is equivalent to y lots of y plus 27. For part b, we have to simplify t cubed to the power of 2. Well, we have the law of indices. One of the laws is when we have a number a and we raise this to the power of m and then we raise this result to the power of n, this is the same as multiplying the powers. So a to the power of m to the power of n is the same as a to the power of m n. And therefore, when we come to simplify t cubed squared, this is the same as t to the power of 3 times by 2, which is the same as t to the power of 6. So we have t to the power of 6. And now for part c, we have to simplify w to the power of 9 divided by w to the power of 4. Well, when we have the same base number and we are dividing, here we'd have to subtract the powers. Of course, a to the power of m divided by a to the power of n is equivalent to a to the power of m minus n. So, of course, here, w to the 9 divided by w to the 4, this is the same as w to the power of 9 minus 4, which is the same as w to the power of 5. So, we have w to the power of 5. Question number 2. The diagram shows a square with perimeter 16 centimetres and we have to work out the proportion of the area inside the square that is shaded. Well, if we know that the perimeter of the square is 16, that means the length of one side of the square is equal to 16 divided by 4, which is 4. So, we have... 4 centimetres here, okay, so we've got 4 centimetres here, and we have 4 centimetres here, so we have 4 centimetres here. Now, we need to work out the shaded area and with that we can find out the proportion of the area inside the square that's shaded. Well, first of all, let's find the area of the square. The area of the square is equal to 4 multiplied by 4 because we have the area of the square. So the area of the square is equal to 16 centimetres squared. Now, you can see we have three different sections. Let's call this first section, section 1. The second section, section 2. This third section, section 3. If we find out the area of section 1 and section 3, we can use the area of the square, the area of section 1 and the area of section 3 
to help us find out the area of section 2 and with that find the proportion of the area inside the square that's shaded. So therefore if we come to work out the area of section 1 well you'd notice here we have a triangle and this missing length over here is equal to 4 centimeters take away 3 centimeters which is 1 centimeter so therefore the area of the section 1 this is equal to 1 half multiplied by the base which is 1 multiplied by the height which is 4 the area of 1 is equal to 2 centimeters squared let's find the area of 3 the area of section 3 is equal to well before we work this out we need the height over here so here we have 4 centimeters take away 2 centimeters which is 2 centimeters so the area of 3 is equal to 1 half times by the base which is 4 times by the height which is 2 so here we end up with 4 centimeters squared for the area of 3 and therefore the area of 1 rather the area of 2 this is equal to the total area 16 take away the area of 1 which is 2 take away the area of 3 which is 4 the area of 2 therefore is equal to 10 centimeters squared and therefore the proportion of the area inside the square that's shaded this is equal to the area of 2 which is 10 divided by the total area of the square 16 so therefore we end up with 5 over 8 so therefore the proportion is equal to 5 over 8 question 3 David has designed a game. He uses a fair six sided dice and a fair five sided spinner. The dice is numbered one to six. The spinner is numbered one to five. Each player rolls the dice once and spins the spinner once. A player can win five pounds or win two pounds. So we win five pounds if we roll a five and spin a five. And we win two pounds if we roll a one or spin a one or both. David expects 30 people will play his game. Each person will pay David one pounds to play the game. For part A, we have to work out how much profit David can expect to make. Well, for this question, we can use a sample space diagram to show the winnings. So here is our diagram and we've got the dice which has numbers 1 to 6 and we've got the spinner which is numbered 1 to 5. Now if we take a look at this statement here, we win £5 if we roll a 5 and spin a 5. So therefore we win £5 if we roll a 5, spin a 5. Let's show that here. We win two pounds if we roll a one so if we roll a one and spin a one well we win two pounds so we win two pounds if we roll a one and that's what we see here or spin a one or both so we win two pounds as we see here and of course for everything else, 
we simply lose. Now, we know already 30 people will pay, play the game. So therefore, how much David earns will be 30 multiplied by 1. So therefore, David will earn 30 multiplied by 1 because each person plays what pays one pound to play the game so therefore we expect david to earn 30 pounds and if we think about the amount of money he has to pay out he will have to pay out if we take a look at the diagram here well we've got six seven eight nine ten multiplied by the two pounds so we've got 10 multiplied by the two pounds and we've also got the five pounds here so therefore we expect him to pay out 25 pounds and therefore the profit is equal to 30 take away 25 we expect his profit to be five pounds and now for part b we have to give a reason why david's actual profit may be different to the profit he expects to make well what we calculated here is a theoretical profit but what we will expect to happen in real life is more or less people may actually win and we may expect more or less than 30 people to play the game so the profit may change so let's just write down that explanation so in part a we calculated a theoretical profit and in reality more or less people will actually win and therefore the profit may change. Question number four. Triangle ABC has perimeter 20 centimetres. AB is equal to 7 centimetres. BC is equal to 4 centimetres. By calculation, we have to deduce whether triangle ABC is a right angled triangle. Well, let's draw out a quick triangle something looking like this we have here a b and c a b is equal to seven centimeters b c that's equal to four centimeters and a c well, if the perimeter is 20 centimetres, AC is equal to 20, which is the perimeter. Take away the 7, which is AB. Take away the 4, which is AC, which is BC. So therefore, AC is equal to 9 centimetres. So AC is equal to 9 centimetres. Now, through Pythagoras, we have a right angle triangle if the sum of the squares of the smaller sides is equal to the larger the square of the larger side so therefore through pythagoras we have the sum of the squares of the smaller sides well that will be 7 squared plus 4 squared we're expecting this to equal 9 squared. And of course, because 49 plus 16 does not equal 81, we can therefore conclude that ABC is not a right angled. triangle
Question 5. One tree of A3 card has an area of 1 8th meter squared. The card has a mass of 160 grams per meter squared. We have to work out the total mass of 25 sheets of A3 card. Well, let's think about what this question is saying. Well, we know here the card has a mass of 160 grams per meter squared. So what we're saying here is for every meter squared of the card, the mass of it is 160 grams. Okay. And what we need to find out is the mass of one sheet of A3 card. Now we know that one A3 sheet of card has mass, has area one eighth meter squared, and we need to find out the corresponding mass. You can see to go from one meter squared to one eighth meter squared, we divide by eight. So of course we need to do the same thing on the other side we need to divide 160 by 8. 160 divided by 8 is 20. So therefore, 1 8th meter squared will represent 20 grams. So what we've just calculated here is the mass of 1 A3 sheet. Now we need to find out the total mass of 25 A3 sheets of card. So therefore, the total mass is equal to 25 because we have 25 sheets of A3 card multiplied by the 20 grams. So therefore we have 500 grams. So therefore the total mass is 500 grams. For question six, part A, we have to work out two and a quarter times three and a third, and we have to give our answer as a mixed number in its simplest form. Well, currently we have two and one quarter multiplied by three and one third. Well, we need to first of all convert these into mixed numbers. So we've got two multiplied by four plus this extra one, and then we're dividing this by four, and then we're multiplying this fraction by three times by three plus one over three, so let's just tidy this up slightly so we don't get confused. We've got this fraction multiplied by this fraction. So if we work this out, eight plus one, that's nine. So we've got nine over four multiplied by, well here we've got nine plus one, which is 10. And then we're dividing this by three. So we've got here, 9 over 4 times 10 over 3. And if we work this out, we've got 90 over 12. We can divide the top and bottom by 3. And if we do that, rather we can um, divide both the top and bottom by 2. So we get 45 over 6. And then dividing that by 3 we have 15 over 2. Now 15 over 2, well 2 goes into 15 7 whole times and what's left over is 1 half. So therefore we have 7 and 1 half. Now for part B we have to write the numbers 3, 4, 5 and 6 in the boxes to give the greatest possible total 
you may write each number only once. Well, we want the biggest number, so we want to use up the 5 and the 6 for the whole numbers here, and then we've got the other bits, which we'll figure out. So let's just put 5 here, and 6 here. Now, we can include the 4 here, and then the 3 here. We could actually use 5 and 2 thirds plus 6 and a quarter. That would have given the same answer. Question 7. A shop has a sale. So, with microwave ovens, we have a third off the normal price, and with combination ovens, we have 40% off the normal price. A microwave oven has a sale price of £90, and a combination oven has a sale price of £84. Which of these ovens has the greater normal price? You must show all your working. Well, first of all, let's concentrate on the microwave ovens. So we will concentrate now on the microwave ovens. Well, here, £90 corresponds to one-third off the normal price. So here, if we have one-third off the normal price, that means if the normal price is X, one third of that will leave us with two thirds. So we have two thirds of the price. Okay. So what we need to do here is find out the original price. Well, here we can multiply by three. So therefore, 90 pounds rather. 90 times by 3, that's 270. So 270 is equal to 2p, and therefore p is equal to 135. So the original price is 135 pounds for the microwave oven. And for the combination oven, well, here, the £84 would correspond to the 40% off the normal price. So here, we have £84 equals 0.6p. So with this, we can find out what, say, 0.1p is by dividing through by 6. So if we divide through by 6, this will tell us what 0.1p is. So that's 14 pounds. And we want to find out what 1p is. So here we'd have to multiply by 10. So 14 times by 10, that's 140. So the normal price of the combination oven is 140 pounds. So therefore we can conclude that the combination ovens have a greater normal price. Question number eight, we have to work out an estimate for the square root of 4.98 plus 2.16 times 3.75. Well here we can round these numbers to nice numbers which will make our calculation easier. So, one way to do this, well, we can round the 4.98 to 5. We can round the 2.16 down to 2. And we can round the 7.35 down to 7. So here we've got the square root of 5 plus 2 times 7. So here we have 5 plus 14 square rooted. Of course here we've got the 
square root of 19. Now, we need to find an estimate for root 19. So the way to think about this is, well, we know that root 16 is approximately 4. We know that root 25 is approximately, is equal to 5 rather, and we are finding an approximation for root 19. So this will be somewhere in between 4 and 5. Now, if we think about it, well, um, well, in between 16 and 25, we've got root 21. So we'd expect root 21 to equal approximately 4.5. So we'd expect root 19 to be slightly less than that, say something like 4.3. And the reason I'm saying root 21 is 4.5 is because halfway between the 4 and the 5 is 4.5. So because root 19 is less than root 21, of course, root 19 will be slightly less than the 4.5. Something sensible is writing 4.3. So we can have 4.3 here as an example of an answer. Question number 9. Here is a cuboid. We have dimensions x, 3x and 2x. All measurements are in centimetres x is an integer, the total volume of the cuboid is less than 900 centimetres cubed. We have to show that x is less than or equal to 5. Well here, the volume is equal to x multiplied by 3x multiplied by 2x. You'd find the volume to equal 6x cubed. And we know that the total volume is less than 900 centimetres cubed. So therefore, 6x cubed is strictly less than 900. And if I divide both sides by 6, you'd find x cubed to be less than 150. Now here we want to show that x is less than or equal to 5. Well, you'd find if x is equal to 5, then 5 cubed is equal to 125. Of course, we're only looking at integers here. And if we take a look at x equals 6, 6 cubed, that's 216, which is larger than the 150. So therefore, because x is less than 150 and of course x equaling 5 satisfies this we can therefore conclude from here that x is less than or equal to 5. Question 10. Y is inversely proportional to x when x is equal to 1.5 y is equal to 36 we have to find the value of y when x is equal to 6. So we have here y being proportional to 1 over x which implies y is equal to k over x. We need to find out what k is. Well we know that when x is equal to 1.5 y is equal to 36. So we have 36 equals k over 1.5 and we need to find out what k is k is equal to 1.5 times 36 which is 54 so therefore y is equal to 54 over x 
Now when x is equal to 6, y is equal to 54 over 6, which is 9. So we have y equals 9 when x equals 6. Question, question number 11. A solid is made by putting a hemisphere on top of a cone, and that's what we see here. The total height of the solid is 5x. The radius of the base of the cone is x. The radius of the hemisphere is x. And the cylinder has the same volume as the solid. The cylinder has radius 2x and height h. All measurements are in centimetres. You have to find a formula for h in terms of x. Give your answer in its simplest form. Well, first of all, we're given that the volume of a cone is equal to one third pi r squared h, and we're given that the volume of a hemisphere is equal to four thirds pi r cubed. Well, you'll notice for the volume of a cone, we have one third pi r squared h, and h here we can easily find by subtracting x from 5x, of course x is the radius of this hemisphere so therefore the height here of the cone is 5x take away x which is 4x so the height of the cone is equal to 4x now, with this, we can find out the volume of the cone and then find out the volume of the hemisphere and therefore find the volume of the solid. So, the volume of the cone is equal to one third times pi times r squared, so here we've got x squared, times by the height, which we said is 4x. So if we work this out, the volume of the cone well here, we've got 4 times by a third, so that's going to be 4 thirds. And then we've got pi, x squared times x, that will be given by x cubed. So the volume of the cone is 4 thirds pi x cubed centimeters cubed. Now the volume of the hemisphere, well, that will be one half of the volume of a sphere. So the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So here we have one half lots of 4 thirds pi r cubed and here of course r is x so here we've got one half lots of first thirds pi x cubed so if we work this out we have two thirds pi x cubed centimeters cubed and therefore we can find out the total volume of the solid so the total volume of the solid is equal to the volume of the cone four thirds pi x cubed plus two thirds pi x cubed which is the volume of the hemisphere four thirds plus two thirds well that's six over three which corresponds to two and then we've got the pi x cubed with it as well so the volume of the solid is four thirds the volume of the solid is two pi x cubed and with this we can find out the volume of the cylinder the volume of the cylinder 
the volume of the uh, cylinder. Well, we've got the circle at the bottom that has area pi r squared. Now r here is equal to 2x. So here we've got pi lots of 2x squared times by h, which is equal to 4 pi x squared h. So therefore, because the volume of the cylinder is equal to the volume of the solid, we can equate these together. We have the volume of the cylinder, 4 pi x squared h. This is equal to 2 pi x cubed. So this is because the volume of the solid is equal to the volume of the cylinder. Our job is to find out what h is. So therefore h is equal to 2 pi x cubed over 4 pi x squared. So therefore h is equal to x over 2. So therefore h is equal to x over 2. Question number 12. A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. E is the point where the diagonals A, C and B, D meet. We have to prove that the triangle A, B, E is congruent to the triangle C, D, E. Well, first of all, you'd find A, B, E, that's this angle here, to be equal to C, D, E. The reason for that is because we have alternate Z angles. And of course, B, A, E, so B, A, E, that's this angle here, is equal to D, C, E, which is this angle here. So let's just write down those properties. We said A, B, E, equals C, D, E. So this angle is equal to this angle. And we said that B, A, E, equals D, C, E. The reason for these is because alternate angles are equal. Now we also know that AB, that's this length here, is equal to DC. So AB is equal to DC and that's because the opposite sides are equal in a parallel program. So what we have over here then is angle angle side. So because we have angle angle side we can therefore conclude that we have a, the triangle A, B, E, and the triangle C, D, E being congruent Question 13. Mr. Brown gives his class a test. The 10 girls in the class get a mean mark of 70%. The 15 boys in the class get a mean mark of 80%. Nick says that because the mean of 70 and 80 is 75, then the mean mark for the whole class in the test is 75%. Nick is not correct. Is the correct mean less than or greater than 75%, you must justify your answer. 
First of all, we know already that the mean is equal to the total over the number of pieces of data we have. So therefore, the total is equal to the mean multiplied by the number of pieces of data we have. So let's find out the total for the boys. We have the mean, which is 80, multiplied by the number of boys we have, which is 15. So therefore, here you can see we have 1,200 for the mean for the total score of the boys. And the total score for the girls, that's equal to the mean which is 70, multiplied by 10, which is the number of girls we have. So therefore, the total score for the girls is 700. So therefore, you can see that the total score for the class is equal to 1200, which is the score for the boys, plus 700, which is the score for the girls, of course, we have 1,900 for the total score. The total number of students we have for the entire class is equal to the 10 boys plus the 15 girls, which is equal to 25. And we can use this formula to find out the mean for the class. So therefore, the mean for the class is equal to 1,900 over 25 which is equal to 76 and because this is greater than the 75 we can therefore conclude the mean mark is greater than 75. Question 14 we have to show that 4 minus root 3 times 4 plus root 3 over 13 simplifies to root 13. Well here what we can do is simplify the top. You'd find here, if we simplify the top, 4 times by 4, that's 16. 4 times by root 3, that will be 4 root 3. Minus root 3 times by 4, that's minus 4 root 3. And minus root 3 times by positive root 3, that's minus 3. And then on the bottom, we still have the root 13. So if we tidy this up, 16 minus 3, you'd find that to be 13. So we have 13 over root 13, which we need to simplify. Now to do this, we need to multiply both the top and bottom by root 13. So we will multiply the top and bottom by root 13. And when we do that, on the top, we've got 13 root 13. On the bottom, we've got th root 13 times root 13, which is 13. Of course, 13s on the top and bottom cancel. Indeed, we're left with root 13. Question 15. For part A, we have to find the value of the cube root of 8 times by 10 to the power of 6. Well, here we can split this, we can rewrite this rather as 8 times by 10 to the power of 6 to the power of 1 third. Of course, cube rooting something is the same as raising something to the power of a third. So each bit inside the bracket we can raise to the power of a third. We have 8 to the power of a third multiplied by 10 to the power of 6 to the power of one third. Okay. Eight to the power of third, that's two. Ten to the six to the power of a third. Well here we need to multiply the powers. So here we've got ten times by ten to the power of six times by a third. So we've got two times by ten to the power of two. And of course this is equal to two hundred. For part B we have to find the value of 144 to the half times 64 to the minus one third. 
So 44 to the half, that's going to be 12. And then we're multiplying this by 64 to the minus one third. And that's of course the same as one over 64 to the power of one third. So we've got 12 multiplied by one over, well, the cube root of 64, that's eight. So we've got one over 12, uh, one, 12 times by one over eight, which is this, uh, rather here we've got 12 over four, which simplifies to three. So we've got three. For part C, we have to solve three to the power of two X equals one over 81. Well, here we need to make the bases the same. Let's just write that down. We need to make the base the same. And if we think about one over 81, one over 81 is the same as 81 to the minus one and 81 is the same as nine squared. So we've got nine squared to the minus one, which is the same as nine to the power of minus two. And we know that nine is the same as three squared. So we've got three squared to the power of minus two. So let's just move this up slightly. And if we multiply the powers here, we've got three to the power of two times minus two, which is minus four. So in other words, we have three to the power of two X equaling three to the minus four. And if we compare the powers, we have two X equals minus four. So therefore X is equal to minus two. X is equal to minus two. Question 16, the probability that Sunny is late for school tomorrow is not 0.05. The probability that Jaden is late for school tomorrow is not 0.15. Alfie says that the probability that Sunny and Jaden will both be late for school tomorrow is not 0.0075 because 0.05 times 0.15 is equal to 0.0075. Well, the fact that these probabilities are being multiplied by each other suggests events are independent. In other words, Sunny being late does not affect Jaden being late. So Sunny being late does not affect Jaden being late, so therefore the events are independent. Question 17, we have to solve x squared minus 6x minus 8 equals 0. You have to write your answer in the form a plus minus root b, where a and b are integers. Well, first of all, let's take a look at completing the square to solve this. If we complete the square, first of all, here we'd have to half the number that's in front of the x. Of course, that's minus 3. So we begin by writing out x minus 3, squaring this result, and then we subtract off the square of the three, and then we still have the minus eight, and all of this is equal to zero. So we have x minus three, all squared, minus nine minus eight equals zero. So we've got x minus three all squared, minus 17 equals zero. x minus three all squared is equal to 17, square rooting, x minus three is equal to plus minus square root 17 and if I add 3 to both sides you'd find x to equal 3 plus minus square root 17. So therefore x is equal to 3 plus minus square root 17. You can if you want use the quadratic formula. Question 18 LMN that is this triangle here is a right angled triangle. The angle N L M is 90 degrees. P Q is parallel to L M. The area of the triangle P 
NQ is 8 cm squared and the area of the triangle LPQ is 16 cm squared. We have to work out the area of the triangle LQM. Well, let's concentrate on these two statements here and let's just redraw those triangles. So if I redraw those triangles, Here, we have this triangle here, okay? And then we've got this triangle here. So, we've got P, Q, and N, and L over here. And then we've got the 90 degrees as we see here. And the area of this triangle is 8 centimeters squared and the area of this triangle is 16 centimeters squared. Well, let's think about how we calculate the area of a triangle. The area of a triangle is equal to, if I just move this a bit over here, this is equal to one half times by the base times by the height. Okay, so how does this help us? Well, here, if we concentrate on the triangle PNQ, we have here one half times by the base, which is PQ times by the height, which is NP, this is equal to 8. And if we concentrate on the triangle LPQ, we have 1 half times by the base, which is PQ, times by the height, which is PL, this is equal to 16. And if you compare what we have here, you can see that because a half PQ appears in both, you can see that from here, PL is equal to twice NP. And that makes a lot of sense. So, what we can do is say, uh, here we've got a height of x, then here we'd have a height of, th of 2x. Okay, well how does this help us? Well, if we concentrate on the triangle NPQ, so triangle NPQ, that is this one over here, so we've got NP and Q and then we've got the larger triangle which is this triangle N L and M then what you can hopefully see here well if here we've got a height of X this height is obviously 3x because we've got x plus 2x which is 3x then you can see here that the length scale factor is equal to 3 because we're going from x to 3x so the length scale factor is 3 so therefore the area scale factor is equal to 3 squared so therefore the area of N L M is equal to 8 multiplied by 3 squared, so we've got 8 times by 9, which is 72. And if we add this to the diagram, here we've got 72 centimeters squared, and here we had 8 centimeters squared. So therefore, to find out this area here, well, that area is equal to 
well, the area of the triangle LQN is equal to 72, which is the entire area. Take away this portion, which is 8. Take away this one here, which is 16. So therefore, we end up with 48 centimeters squared. We have 48 centimeters squared. Question number 19. The histogram shows information about the time taken by cyclists to finish a cycle race. So here we've got the frequency density and here we've got the time in minutes. Seven cyclists took 80 minutes or less to finish the race. And for the first part, we have to work out an estimate for the number of cyclists who took more than 105 minutes to finish the race. Well, first of all, with these sorts of problems, of course, in a frequency density question, a histogram question, we need to recognise that frequency density multiplied by class width gives the frequency. Now, we know that 70, that seven cyclists took 80 minutes or less to finish the race. So this refers to this area that we see here. Okay, so let's just shade all of it in. So, seven cyclists took 80 minutes or less to finish the race. You can see the class width here is 10. The frequency is 7. So therefore, the frequency density here is equal to the frequency, which is 7, divided by the class width, which is 10. Of course, the frequency density is 0 0.7. So we have 0 0.7 over here. So because we have 0 0.7 here, here we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Because each little square is 0 0.1. So 7 little squares corresponds to the 0 0.7. And what we're looking for here is an estimate for the number of cyclists who took more than 105 minutes. So 105, you can see that's here. So here we've got 105. And we're after the number over here. So let's just show this in by shading. This area here is what we want to find out okay so this area is what we will work out so the frequency here is equal to the class width which is from 105 to 120 that's 15 times by the frequency density which is 1.2 so this is equal to 18 so therefore, we have 18 cyclists. And now for the next part, we have to explain why our answer to the first part is only an estimate. Well, of course, here the data is grouped. So what does this mean? Well, it means here that we don't know how many people there are in an interval of 100 to we don't know how the interval is spread out that's what we mean by that when we said the data is question number 20 We have to show that 3x plus 6 over x squared minus 3x minus 10 divided by x plus 5 over x cubed minus 25x simplifies to ax, where a is an integer. So 
what we will do here is first of all attempt to factorize where we can so first of all x squared minus 3x minus 10 well we can simplify that to x plus 2 lots of x minus 5 and on the top we've got 3 lots of x plus 2 and then we are dividing this by well x cubed minus 25x I can take out an x as a common factor so then I've got x squared minus 25 and on the top we've got x plus 5 so if I simplify this even more well here we have on the bottom x plus 2 x minus 5 on the top here we've got three lots of x plus 2 and then we're dividing this by well on the bottom we've got x lots of well here we've got a difference of two squares we've got x minus 5 lots of x plus 5 and on the top we've got x plus 5 okay so that is how much we can simplify the top and now if we tidy up this even more well we can see here that the x plus 2's cancel on the top and bottom oh, let's write it here the x plus 2's cancel on the top and bottom and the x plus 5's cancel on the top and bottom so here we've got 3 over x minus 5 divided by 1 over x lots of x minus 5 and we need to simplify all this well here when we divide fractions we have to flip the second fraction and change the divide to a times so we've got 3 over x minus 5 multiplied by x lots of x minus 5 over 1 okay so if we tidy this up this will be equivalent to well here we've got 3x lots of x minus 5 over x minus 5 which simplifies to 3x okay so that's how we go about these sorts of questions because this and this of course cancel out so we end up with 3x so therefore a is equal to 3 question 21 we have to solve the inequality x squared being greater than x plus being greater than 3 lots of x plus 6 well here first of all we've got x squared being greater than 3x plus 6 and if I rearrange so we have something being greater than 0 we have x squared minus 3x minus 6 being greater than 0 and if we factorize this we have x minus 6 lots of x plus 3 being greater than 0 and now if we replace the inequality sign with an equal sign we have x minus 6 lots of x plus 3 equaling 0 from which we can see our critical values we have x equals 6 and minus 3 so when we come to well let's just draw a quick sketch to illustrate what's going on we've got solutions at minus 3 and 6 so here we've got 6 and minus 3 we've got y here and x here we're looking at where the solution is greater than 0 greater than 0 here and here so therefore we have x being greater than 6 and also x being less than minus 3 question 22 the line l is a tangent to the circle 
x squared plus y squared equals 40 at the point A. Point A has coordinates 2, 6. The line L crosses the x-axis at the point P. We have to work out the area of the triangle, or AP. Well, let's draw a diagram to visualise what's going on. So, of course, here we've got the coordinate axis. So, let's just show that here somewhere. We've got the y-axis and the x-axis over here. So let's just draw a circle. So this circle here, let's show it in a different colour. The circle um, here is the equation x squared plus y squared equals 40. So let's just write that down. Here we have the equation x squared plus y squared equals 40, which I'm going to rewrite. Well, I'm going to rewrite this as root 40 all squared. Now, you can, if you want, leave this as 40. But the reason I would like to leave this as root 40 is because you can see then the radius is root 40. Now we've got this point A over here somewhere and then we've got a tangent to the circle at this point. So let's just draw on this tangent like so. And if I just amend this diagram. If we think about what the question is saying, then here we've got the point A with coordinates 2, 6 and we've got this radius which is perpendicular to the tangent. So this is the line L over here. We can find out where L intersects the x-axis and from that we can Recognise here we've got the base and the height, of course, is equal to 6. So let's find out the equation of L to find out where it intersects the x-axis. Well, to do that, we need to find out the gradient of the radius. So the gradient of the radius, that's equal to the change in y, so that will be equal to 6 take away 0 of the change in x, 2 take away 0, the gradient of the radius is equal to 3. And because we know that the tangent is perpendicular to the radius, we can therefore conclude that the gradient of the tangent is equal to minus 1 third. And with this, we can find out the equation of L. Of course, we want L to be of the form y equals mx plus c. So therefore, if we substitute in the coordinates of a to 6, we've got y minus y1. So here we're going to have y minus 6 equals gradient, lots of x minus 2. So let's rewrite this in the form y equals mx plus c. So we've got y minus 6 equals minus one third plus two thirds. Rather here we've got minus one third x plus two thirds. So therefore, if I add six to both sides, you'd find y to equal minus one third x plus 20 over three. So therefore, L has equation y equals minus one third x plus 20 over 3. And with this, when y is equal to 0, we've got 0 equals minus one third x plus 20 over 3. So if I rearrange this, we've got x equals 
20. So therefore, the coordinate here is 20 across 0 up. Now let's draw out this shape so we can visualize what area we need to work out. Of course, here we've got the coordinates of P. So if I draw out the shape O, A, P, we've got over here, if I just show everything, we've got O, P, and A. Let's show the coordinates of A as 2, 6. Coordinates of P, 20, 0. Well, the base here is equal to 20. The height of this, if I show the height over here, we've got 6. So therefore, the area is equal to 1 half times by the base, which is 20, times by the height, which is 6. So we've got 10 times by 6, which is 60. So therefore, the area is equal to 60 units squared.